Thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, my name is Lon Ingram, and today I'm going to be talking about how to handle failures in your application um, in the wild in your user's hands. So in other words, um, you know, your, your, your app has gone through testing, you, you've written tons of tests, you ran JS hand, you guys are like awesome process, you did your best to do code quality, um, but it's still going to fail, and a lot of times you're going to get bug reports that look sort of like this. Um, this is really frustrating uh, as a developer, you know, because you're like, well, I don't know what that means. I mean, how am I supposed to figure out what's wrong and uh, diagnose and, and debug this problem for you if this is all the information you get? But, I mean, when you think about it, it's not really um, the user's fault. It's, it's our fault. It's our responsibility to provide them with the information that they need to tell us what we need to know. We're the ones with the technical know-how. We're the ones that know how our application works. And so we need to provide them the tools that allow them to tell us how to fix these problems. Um, so first, we're gonna, uh, I'm going to try and convince you that in spite of all of your awesome code quality process, you are still going to ship code that has bugs in it. Um, then I'm going to talk to you about how to make sure that you find out uh, when failures happen in your application. Uh, the first step is to actually have your code detect that something has gone wrong um, every time something goes wrong. Um, next, I'm going to talk about how to get a report from your user to you um, and briefly discuss how to talk to your users about failures when they happen as far as like what do you tell your user in the browser. Um, last, I'm going to demo a, uh, an experimental uh, browser replay technology called Reanimator, which is based on a cool Microsoft research project. So a little bit about me. Um, I started developing JavaScript in 2006. Um, when I got out of the Air Force, uh, my buddy said, hey, I've got a job. You have to learn JavaScript. And I said, OK. Um, and it turned out to be a really awesome thing because I love the language. Um, for the last three years, I've been working on um, single page apps only. Um, in fact, I've never actually worked on what would be called like a real website. Um, so I have a sort of odd background from, uh, uh, compared to a lot of JavaScript engineers. Um, but it means that I've, I've, had, I've done like a really deep dive on how to build sort of complicated apps that run for a really long time in the browser and some of the um, challenges that happen as a result. Um, I have this silly project called uh, Spooky.js, which is a way to drive um, Casper.js, which is a friendlier uh, API on top of um, Phantom.js. So it's a way to drive that from Node. Um, and finally, I worked on a research project called Treehouse, which is this like way to sandbox um, untrusted JavaScript in a web worker uh, and then give it like a fake DOM. It's completely insane. Uh, as Alex Sexton once described it, it's totally awesome and completely impractical. So uh, if you want to hear about that, uh, find me afterward. So first, bad things are going to happen to your code. Um, you know, some people who are maybe are not engineers might say like, oh, well, why are you spending all this time fixing bugs? Why don't you just write your code correctly to begin with? And then you won't have to take the bugs out. Um, well, as we know, I mean, that's not really realistic. Uh, this is a sort of widely cited statistic um, from Steve McConnell, who wrote um, Code Complete, which is that most code has uh, between 15 and 50 bugs per thousand lines of code. Um, and with like really aggressive and careful code review, you can get that down to maybe around 10. But the only software uh, organizations that have ever even approached zero are, you know, NASA. Um, and that requires just a, an incredibly rigorous process where they have like binders of routines that they've been using for 30 years and are known to be correct and they don't change anything at all without having, you know, a bunch of engineers talk about it. Um, and that's not how we build web applications because it would take forever. So your code's going to have bugs. And th this is okay. You just need to know that this is the case. Um, even if you have tests, uh, you know, tests are great. Um, tests are important. Um, but the thing about tests is um, they don't prove correctness, number one. And number two, they're sort of uh, fundamentally uh, a way of seeing what your application does under a very sort of artificial and constrained set of circumstances. Uh, and as a result, um, even if you have 100% coverage, you don't really know what can happen to your app under all inputs. Um, and sort of the, the, uh, the most basic reason why this is the case is because you can't actually get to 100% coverage in the browser because your code also calls into library code, either jQuery or um, uh, you know, into the browser itself. 
Um, and unless you actually are able to achieve 100% uh, code coverage in calling into those libraries, which you can't, then um, you are not going to be able to uh, find out how your app will truly perform. Um, and the other thing is that if you kind of think about it, um, the bugs that your users are going to encounter are, in fact, exactly those bugs that you didn't write a test for. Because if you'd written a test for it, you would have found the bug at the beginning, and uh, you would have fixed it before you shipped. That said, um, don't go and say, oh, Lonsai, we don't have to write any tests anymore. We're just, let's delete JS hint. That stuff doesn't work. Um, no, totally. You have to do this stuff. This is like the bare minimum of uh, professional responsibility is to you know, uh, write tests, have automated tests that run whenever you build your code, uh, run JS hint or some sort of code linter, have code standards, do code reviews. Um, these are necessary, but they're not sufficient, and they're not going to stop, uh, stop failures in the wild. Your code is going to fail in the wild, and it's going to do it in ways that you did not expect. So the first step is to realize that something's gone wrong. Um, and this is important because this, uh, users, like, particularly technically unsophisticated users, are, are going to have a really hard time helping you figure out how to reproduce a problem um, if you don't catch the failure as soon as possible after it occurs. Uh, this is a sort of simplified version of some code from our app. Um, and what it does is it, uh, it pulls this API to pull down the latest activity in a feed. Um, and then at this time, the, uh, at the time of, of this bug, the uh, API didn't allow you to like, pivot on an ID. So you actually had to like, go back through and look until you find like, the last one that you saw so you're not putting duplicates in there. Um, and so that's what this code does. It basically just like, looks through the results and finds the, the new results in, that, um, in, the, in the payload and then it attaches them to this activity array. Um, and here's the problem. This code makes an assumption down there at the bottom that there's at least one element in the, um, in the activity. And that is not necessarily the case. Uh, it might be that there was no activity at all, or it could be that the user cleared the activity between when the um, poll kicked off and when the results returned. And so, what ends up happening, uh, and, and, and the other crucial part of this equation, is that your users aren't going to be running with uh, their debugger set up. So when they hit a JavaScript error, their browser's not going to tell them. And so all of a sudden, your app is going to just be in this inconsistent state wherever it happened to halt, and it's going to keep on going. And your user is going to experience the consequences of that, hopefully soon, but maybe not for five or 10 minutes. And so then they'll tell you, oh, well, I clicked on this thing and I got a bug. And really, that had nothing to do with it. In fact, the bug was this polling that happened five minutes earlier. So you really want to notify your users as soon as possible. Um, and so before we go any further on this, let me just uh, break failures up into two sort of large categories. There are um, recoverable failures, and these are ones that you know how to do something about, or at least anticipate it. Um, you may not know how to recover from them in any manner other than saying, uh, we're out of luck. I need you to come back later. Um, and then there's unrecoverable errors. And these are typically um, ones that you just were unable to anticipate or um, happen in places. You know, If you have like a runtime JavaScript error, then um, that's an unrecoverable error. You didn't expect that. You didn't design your code to um, throw an error in the middle of its execution. So unrecoverable errors are always fatal. Um, your code has sort of gone off into the unknown. Uh, it's now operating in a state that you, as the developer, never anticipated and did not design for. Um, and so really, the only thing to do is to crash, uh, which in the browser means reload the page. Um, and that will return you, hopefully, to a consistent state. If the bug is during startup, then um, that's kind of a bummer. But uh, in, in a lot of cases, this is what you're going to need to do. Um, so the way I like to crash is uh, to render a modal notice um, and have a button on there. I, I tell the user what's gone wrong uh, to the extent that that's possible. And then I have a button on there that if they click it, um, it will reload the page. Uh, and that's what this code does. This is a very simple jQuery UI um, example. Uh, it just allows you to specify a message and then some details. Um, and then it loads a, dial uh, a dialog, a modal dialog that they can't close. They can only click the button to reload. 
Um, in the case of recoverable failures, uh, sometimes it makes sense to retry. Uh, the classic example of this would be a uh, 503, where you know, you're making some API call to a, to a server, and the server says, uh, I'm temporarily unavailable. Um, well, you know, temporarily in, in a lot of those cases means like I'm un unavailable for five seconds. So it makes sense in that case to wait a sec and try again. And in fact, it makes sense to wait a sec and try again maybe before telling your user. Uh, uh, that kind of depends on your application. But uh, there's, a, there's a couple things you want to keep in mind if you're going to do this retrying. Number one, uh, it's a good idea to do exponential back off. And what that means is um, however long you waited, wait twice that length the next time you retry. So if you're going to wait 30 seconds before you try the first time, when you try the second time, wait 60 seconds. When you try the third time, wait 120 seconds. And then finally, you need to give up after a certain number of retries or at a minimum bound that exponential growth because otherwise it gets really big really fast. Um, and, and if you get to some limit where you know, you've tried five times and you've been unable to connect, you need to tell the user at that point. You need to tell them, look, I can't save your work right now. I'll save it to local storage and I'll sync it up to the, um, to the server as soon as I can. But for right now, I just need you to know that it's not getting saved and if you, you know, that, that, that you could potentially lose data. Um, in other cases, retrying just won't help, and you shouldn't do it. Uh, a good example of this is if you uh, make an API call and the server returns a 400, um, that means that you sent an, a malformed request, and retrying isn't going to help. You're just going to make the same malformed request, and you're going to have the same result. So in that case, um, you need to tell the user what, that, that something's gone wrong and tell them you know, uh, what the impact of that is. And I'll get into that a little bit more later on in the slide deck about um, what you can tell your users. But basically, you want to notify the user and then return to some sort of consistent state. So how do, we, how do you detect failures in synchronous code? There's two main uh, ways that you do this in JavaScript. Um, the first uh, in the browser is that you need to always have an on error handler, uh, which is uh, a, you register that on the window object. Um, if, if you get to, uh, so basically what happens is if, if, if an error or an exception bubbles all the way up out of your code and uh, is caught by the browser, then the browser will invoke, will, will fire an error event on the window object. Um, and this is basically your last chance to know that something has gone wrong. Um, and you, at this point, you're crashing. Like, you, you, you have not, there, there's no sort of structured exception handling going on. You have no real plan. Recovering from an on-error handler is, is a very difficult and, and I think not very uh, wise thing to try and do. So really what you're trying to do here is you're trying to get some sort of debugging information out to your user uh, or to your app, so that, or, or, excuse me, to your back end, um, so that you can try and figure out what went wrong at a later date. Um, in an on-error handler, you get the message, you get the line number, and the URL. Um, in today's world of minified JavaScript, this is actually kind of not very helpful, because um, a lot of times line number is going to be one or two, and the line is like 60,000 characters long. Um, so some of the new browsers, uh, Fire Firefox has uh, started to offer a character position. Um, and I suspect that something will happen uh, in terms of source maps with, with this, but n nothing's really happened yet. Um, so it's kind of a bummer to catch things in on air. So what you really want to do is you want to wrap all of your top-level code in try-catch blocks. Um, and, and there's a couple reasons for this. For one thing, you, you get an error instance, and an error instance is a much, much better um, debugging, uh, it's, it's source of debugging information. Um, all the browsers provide, at a minimum, the name of the error, um, type error, uh, runtime error, something like that, and whatever message uh, the, the, the browser generated or you generated in your code. Um, but most of the recent browsers also provide a stack trace, um, either as a string or as an array of strings. Um, and this is really useful uh, because it allows you to get uh, some idea of what led up to the failure at a later date based on the bug report from your user. Um, so here's just a very simple example in, a, uh, in, a, in an on, uh, the ready function uh, of, a, of a jQuery app. You know, you're, you're calling some top-level initialize uh, method to set your app up. If something goes wrong, then it's, uh, if something throws an, an exception, then you're going to catch it and you're going to crash. There's no real way to recover at this point. Um, so, but at least this way, you'll get, you'll get the, uh, the debugging information out. Um, for older browsers, there's this uh, thing called StackTrace.js, um, and it tries to 
uh, basically uh, recover a stack trace when possible by following arguments.caller and arguments.callee back up the call chain. Um, it works pretty well. It depends. It, it, it can handle bound functions, and in, in, in any sort of recursion, it has to quit. Um, it can't, you know, it'll, as soon as it hits a cycle, it has to stop. Um, but it, it's, it's worth looking into. Um, so if you're going to be doing exception handling, uh, which you should, there are a few rules um, that you should always follow. Number one, uh, never catch an exception that you can't do anything about. Um, if, if you can't do anything about it, just let it fly on past you. Don't, don't wrap it in, you know, don't, if, if you're going to call some function that might throw an exception um, and you're not at the top level, if there's somebody above you, some code above you that you're uh, calling context, then you should not wrap that. Let it go up to the higher calling context that might be able to do something about it. Unfortunately, in JavaScript, this is kind of tough to stick to because unlike Java and some other uh, Python and other sorts of languages like that, you can't say, I only want to catch type errors or I only want to catch timeouts. You, can, you have to catch everything, right? Um, so if, you're, if you know how to recover from, say, like one error, but you don't know how to recover from anything else that might happen, then you need to check the exception to see if, uh, if it was the one you can uh, handle. And if it is, then handle it. And otherwise, you need to rethrow the same exception. Uh, and the reason you do that is because if you throw a new exception, then you've lost the stack trace from the original exception, and you don't know what caused the problem. Um, finally, if you get an exception, if an exception bubbles all the way up to your top level uh, exception handler, uh, then at that point, you have to crash. There's not really anything you can do other than try to sort of gracefully uh, uh, crash the application. Uh, now, the hard, harder part is async code. Um, and, and, and what this comes down to is that when uh, in callbacks, callbacks are not invoked by your code. They're invoked by some other party, either jQuery or the browser. And so there's no way for you to wrap that code in a try-catch block, typically. You have to depend either on jQuery to do it for you, or you have to, or you can't do it at all. Like in the case of a set timeout, if you throw from a uh, callback in a set timeout, then there's no way to catch that outside of your callback. So the result of this is that you should never throw in a callback. Um, and in fact, any code that you that could throw, you need to wrap in uh, a try catch block, so that uh, if something that you're calling into, for example, JSON.parse will throw if you feed it bad, bad data, um, then You'll, you'll catch it, and you can uh, report what actually happened. Rather than, if you don't do this, then it'll go to your on-air handler, where you'll, you'll have much less information. Um, and you can either do this yourself, uh, like sort of for every function, you know, you're going to do this. Or I like to, to kind of come up with utility methods. Um, this one, uh, basically what it does is it takes a callback, and it returns a new callback that invokes the, the past callback with the correct context and arguments. Um, inside a try-catch block, and if it catches uh, an exception, then it crashes uh, and renders the uh, modal. Um, so there's two ways to use um, async operations in jQuery. You can either use a callback style, where you set a success and error handler. Um, if you're going to do it that way, you need to always provide an error handler, um, because otherwise you will ignore these errors, and your app will proceed along happily thinking that something has succeeded when, in fact, it has failed. Um, and so here I've got uh, two safe callbacks, one for success and one for failure. Um, the other way to do things is to do promises. And if you're going to do promises, then you want to always make sure that you provide a fail handler. Um, unfortunately, for um, compatibility reasons, jQuery's promises are not quite as nice as some other promises you may have heard about. Um, in Promises A+, and similar uh, styles of promises, if you throw in a, um, in, a, in a promise callback, like if you, it's, you know, then and then some function, you throw in that function, as long as you provide a done or fail handler, then the promise library will catch your exception and reject the promise and pass it through to your... Um, to your fail or done handler. Uh, and this is awesome. Unfortunately, jQuery does not do this. So you need to do some, something like this safe callback strategy to make sure that you actually catch any exceptions that might be thrown. So um, how do you get a report? How do you get the, we, we've caught the error. Um, we have some debugging information. We want to get it out of the user's browser and onto our server, onto our desktop, so we can do something about it. Uh, Sort of the simplest minimum solution is to just have them send you an email. 
Um, and this sounds kind of uh, silly, but it, I mean, it, it, for simple apps, it actually works pretty well. Um, you just encode the report as a mail to link, uh, and you ask the user to click it, and that'll launch their email client and send you the email. And they'll have the opportunity at that point uh, to add some context. You know, they can say, well, I was doing this, and then this happened, and then I, you know, now I got the bug. Um, and so the main pro is that everybody has email. Um, you can pretty much depend that all of your users have some sort of email client and that clicking a mail to link will launch some email client. Um, maybe not the correct one, but hopefully. Uh, the other thing is that the user can add helpful context. They can say, like, okay, I, w I, was, I clicked here, and then I uh, loaded a new file, and then this happened, and then it crashed. Um, and sometimes that can be helpful. Uh, the main con is that these mail to links, uh, the, they can be very limited in some browsers, uh, and the limit varies wildly. Um, so an alternative to that is to ask the user to cut and paste your um, debugging information into the email. Uh, unfortunately, uh, number one, this is error prone. They won't always do it correctly. Uh, and number two, it, you're, you're already asking the user to do one thing after your app has broken. In other words, the user's you know, not happy with you. Your app didn't work, and now you're saying, okay, I know that I let you down by my app not working, but could you do me this favor real quick? Um, and, and you know, it, it, if they think about it, then they'll do it because they want the, the bug to get fixed. But uh, you know, it, it just adds a little bit more barrier. It makes it more likely that the user will just say, you know, never mind and reload the browser. Um, so the sort of more complicated version of this is to do a web form. You just render some sort of modal with a web form, and then when you when they click, and you can ask them uh, to add any context that they might want to, and then when they submit it, it posts back to uh, some server somewhere and includes the um, debugging information. Um, so the primary advantage here is that you have sort of like an arbitrary amount of uh, payload data you can include. Um, you can include quite a lot of data in this. Um, and the user can still add context. Uh, the disadvantage uh, is that uh, you're still asking the, uh, the user to do something for you. Um, and also, you have to have server-side support. That's not that big of a deal, but it, you know, uh, in sort of like lightweight, agile projects, then that might be too much to ask um, of the server-side team. If there is one, or maybe you're the server-side team and you don't have time to do that. Um, so to deal with the fact that the user may not want to actually submit these reports, what you can do is you can send automated reports. So when you are in your error handler, uh, as part of crashing, you, um, you, know, you generate an XHR and you send it to some backend server somewhere with your debugging information in the payload. Um, so the biggest advantage of this is that it doesn't require uh, the user to do anything. Um, you have, you, you've taken them out of the equation, you just go ahead and send the report and then you ask them, you know, and then you tell them what, that something has gone wrong. Um, you can also get kind of clever with this. Uh, you can, um, if, if they've encountered a bug that you have fixed since, they, since you shipped the code that they're running, um, you can either return, per, you might be able to patch your code um, by telling, it, you know, telling your app to download and run some JavaScript that fixes the bug. Um, that's pretty crazy. Uh, seems like it'd be fun to do, but I, I, you know, it might be hard. Um, and you can definitely send uh, some sort of UI advice, something you can tell the user about the bug you know, and say, look, um, here's a workaround. If you instead do what you just did in this different way, then you won't hit the bug. Um, and that can be very helpful to your users because then they can complete what they are trying to do um, and so they'll feel better about your app. Um, so the cons, again, this requires server-side support. You have to have some server somewhere that's going to accept the, uh, the API call. Uh, and you don't get an opportunity to gather context from the user. Um, this is uh, sort of sort of iffy. So, so the user can provide good context in, some, uh, in some, some cases. In other cases, they provide a lot of stuff that isn't very helpful. There's a sort of subcategory of user that thinks that they know about computers. And they will provide all sorts of detailed information that have nothing to do with anything. Um, but even, even that sort of thing can still help. Sometimes they'll unintentionally uh, or, or, or um, inadvertently give you the, what you need to know, some sort of clue. Um, the other thing that's going to happen is that there's going to be a lot of duplicates. Um, and if you think about this, this must be the case, right? So like, if you're going to automatically submit the same report for the same bug, more than one user is probably going to hit that bug, and um, probably for the same reasons, and you're going to get duplicate reports. Some of the more uh, advanced backends 
I can do some deduping for you. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, stuff out there in that space. I, I'm I'm not going to get into that, but um, basically it's just something to keep in mind. So what I recommend is uh, you sort of do both. Um, and what I mean is this: when you when you get the failure, go ahead and automatically submit uh, a bug report to your back end, generate some sort of unique ID, uh, and then you notify the user and you ask them for feedback. Um, and if they give you some feedback, then you uh, you know, tag it with that unique ID and you send it up to your back end and you append it to your original report. And that way you have both. You, have, you always get your, your report and if the user is willing and able to give you some context, then you get that context as well. Um, so where do you send the report? Um, there's, there's a lot of these services out there that are, that are in this space of doing um, client side error uh, reporting. Um, uh, the, the, the two that I've heard the most about are Errorception and Sentry. Um, I, I urge you to, to check all these out. Um, you can also do what we're doing at Waterfall, which is you can just roll your own back end. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and, uh, and that way you can, you can design something that's, that's specific to your needs. So what do you put in the report? Um, so at a minimum, you want a serialized version of that information that you got from your error handlers earlier. So if it's an on error, then you've got the, the, the message and the URL and the line number. Hopefully, it's, you, you got an actual error instance and you have a stack trace. Um, additional context can be helpful, uh, but it's kind of difficult to know what, uh, what's going to be of use. Uh, and what I mean by this is that you know, your app has, uh, for, for particularly single page apps, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of data uh, that you could include. You could serialize your, you know, the entire view model for whatever page you're on and send that along. Um, but there's a cost to that, and the cost is that at debugging time, you have to sift through that information. Um, and it can be nice to have, but it can also, uh, it can also be sort of a red herring in a lot of cases. And, and something that was useful last time may not be useful this time. Um, so, so you want to you think carefully about what you include in your bug reports. Um, but there are a few things that are uh, definitely worth including. Um, if you have a failure in uh, async code, uh, one thing that's really awesome to have is the, uh, is the uh, call stack of the function that invoked the asynchronous operation. In other words, the call stack at the point that you call $.ajax, okay? Because your, if your callback throws an error, you're going to have a short stack trace that originates in jQuery, and it's not going to be particularly helpful. Um, but if you know what led to the request, then you have more information and might be able to figure out why you ended up in this, uh, in this failure state to begin with. So the way you handle this um, is you, uh, you, you instantiate a new error object, and that has a stack property, or hopefully has a stack property. Um, and then you attach that to your callback and you include it in your report at the time that the, uh, the app fails. Um, if you're calling an external API, then it's useful to include uh, the URL that you're, uh, you were calling, the um, HTTP method, get, post, that sort of thing, any parameters or payload, basically all of the context of the API, so that if you get back a 400, and that's what you're reporting, that you, your failure is that you got back a 400 or you got a 500, um, you, uh, A, have information to help debug your end of things and can also help the uh, back-end uh, folks rather uh, debug uh, any problems that might be on their end. So the last, uh, the last thing to talk about is what do you tell your user? Um, this is kind of a difficult question um, simply because it, it really depends on your app and it depends on your target audience. Um, if, you have, uh, if you're building an app for a, you know, a, a sort of general public audience, then including a lot of technical detail is not going to be helpful. Um, and in fact, it, it, it's kind of user hostile. You're, you're telling them things that they can't really do anything with or about. Um, and so in that case, you should give sort of very uh, user-oriented um, error messages. You know, things like, you know, we were unable to save your document. Uh, we will try again in a few minutes. Um, on the other hand, if, you're, if your target audience is technically savvy, if you're building uh, a code editor, for example, in that case, it might be useful to include more detailed debugging information um, because you know that your audience has the, 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 the skills and the tools to be able to possibly take that information, use the context that they have from being present when the failure occurred, and give you some, uh, a clue as to what went wrong. 
at a minimum, you need to tell the user um, these, these things. You need to tell them how bad it is. Uh, are they going to be able to finish doing what they just tried to do? Did they lose data? Um, will trying again work? Can they try again? Um, next, you need to tell them what they, what they can do. Can they try again? Uh, do they need to reload the browser? Um, that sort of thing. Finally, uh, in order to get your bug report back, you need to, uh, you need to tell them who to tell, um, how to tell them, and you need to tell them uh, you know, what, what it is that you need to know. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, your, your automated process takes care of most of this, but if you do need information from your users' uh, context to help you with the debugging, then this is where you need to tell them about that. OK, but none of this is actually going to help. Um, you're still going to get uh, these sort of things happening to you. What, you. what would be really cool is if you could like, be there when the user uh, encounters the bug and um, actually witness the failure firsthand. And then you can use your developer tools. You can you know, break on errors and see what's going on. Um, and so that's what inspired me to work on this project called Reanimator. Uh, so Reanimator is inspired by a project out of Microsoft Research led by this gentleman, James Mickens. Um, this is him in his throne of JS. Uh, and it's, uh, it was called Mugshot. And Mugshot is um, a pretty simple idea. And the idea is this. Um, computers are deterministic. And what that means is that given the same inputs, uh, they will always arrive at the same result. So if you're able to capture all of the input into your application, so the clicks, the um, timers, random numbers, those sorts of things, you capture that to a log. You can later run that program again and replay that log as fake input to your program. And you will hopefully, if everything works correctly, um, then you'll see the same execution trace. The code will take the same path through your application that the user's uh, browser did when it ran uh, at failure time. OK, so let, this is probably easier to just sort of demo. So I've got a short demo to show you guys. What I did was I took um, the to do MVC um, backbone uh, example application, and I modified it in a couple ways. I replaced their version of jQuery with um, a version that uh, it gets monkey patched to, uh, to provide some hooks that reanimator needs. It's not, it's not extensive changes. Um, and I also added some stuff up at the head to initiate the logging and, um, and capture the log itself. And finally, uh, I changed it so it'll throw when I type, uh, if I type crash in uh, as part of a task, then it'll throw an error so I can demonstrate how that works. Um, but, but the point that I'm trying to make is that there, was, there were not a ton of changes that were necessary to make this happen. OK, so. Um, uh, Right, so um, you can you know, click around in this guy, and let's, com let's complete a couple of those, and we can see the ones that I've completed. We go back here, let's clear them out. Finally, time to crash. All right, so here, if I click this link, what's gonna happen is I'm going to launch the, uh, the same application in a new tab, so a completely new uh, runtime environment. There's no carryover from the previous one, um, but it's going to be in replay mode. It's going to take the log, which is stored in local storage in this case, and replay that. Um, and so you guys can see the uh, actual failure in the browser, in the, excuse me, in the debugger. I'm going to um, uh, start the, the developer tools. Hopefully this will work. OK, so as you can see, What's actually happening here is uh, Reanimator is replaying this input as fake browser events. Um, to do MVC, I didn't have to change anything about to do MVC. It doesn't have to know anything about Reanimator. It thinks things are just happening the way that they did when I was typing in it. And uh, when we get to the point of failure, um, which is right, right about now, uh, then boom, I get. Uh, the actual error in my debugger um, at a later date. And so that is the basic idea. Um, so cool, right? Uh, there's probably some problems here. Um, so first, this is a tech demo. Um, it's not at all ready for, for uh, production. 
Um, we're working on getting it ready to deploy in our application. Um, the problem with, uh, the problem is kind of difficult to solve. Getting the replay correct is very difficult to solve and requires you to do some, uh, basically, uh, you, you, you don't have to target your application specifically, but you have to target things like jQuery specifically. Um, and, and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll get to that in a sec. First, let's talk about overhead. I'm sure that that's a, a question that people have. Um, so it's, it's not really possible to know what reanimator's overhead is yet because it is so early. Um, but we know what mugshots was. Um, and they experienced the, a log growth rate. Uh, you know, you got to log all this stuff, and that log's going to get bigger. Um, of between uh, 10 and 106 um, kilobits per second, which is a lot, but is not um, terrible. Um, and you know, there's various strategies you could use to sort of uh, segment those logs and send them up to the server once they get too big, then truncate them and, and so forth. And the other thing to mention is that the 106 kilobits per second, that is when they were um, capturing mouse move events, which there are a lot of. Um, and so for most applications, it's not necessary to capture those sorts of events. As far as actual processing overhead, it's sort of between 1 and um, 7%. And again, that 7% uh, is if you're capturing lots of mouse events, um, and specifically mouse move, mouse over, those sorts of events. Um, and if your application doesn't need to log those, you don't have to log them. Uh, and so you're, there will be less overhead. And in, and in general, web applications spend most of their time waiting for the user to do something. So uh, this sort of overhead is very doable. Um, so the limitations are, number one, that browsers make it hard to do this replay. Um, the, the, a good example of this is um, if you want to generate a, a synthetic key press event in um, WebKit, when you tell it, okay, I want you to, to generate key code 13, it'll say, cool, I'm going to use key code 0. And there's nothing you can do to change that. Um, so you actually have to depend on um, jQuery to fix that up. And that's that the, most of the work in jQuery was to get jQuery to, to pull out the, the key code from the log and stick it into the which event. Um, any CSS stuff is, is not going to get replayed. If you have a mouse move event, the mouse is not going to, in fact, move. Um, and also, you've got to do the replay on the same build of the code as capture occurred, because otherwise you don't know that the code paths would be the same. And you probably want to do it on the same browser. You can try replaying in another browser, but um, it's likely that there will be some differences. So to recap, uh, your code's going to fail. Um, so you need to be ready for that. It's going to fail in ways that you don't expect. The sooner you can detect a failure, the better. Um, it'll allow you to, to, uh, to help your users to tell you what you need to know. So get the information about that problem. Send a report to your back end so you have something to go on. And then tell the user what's going on. You know, let them know and do your best to uh, help them either work around the problem or, at a minimum, help you to fix the problem for them at a later date. So thanks a lot. Um, so all my contact information. I don't have the slides up yet, but I'll have them up later on today. And it looks like I've got a couple minutes for questions. Yes. Thank you. Sure. Ah. So uh, the question was, what about privacy, which is an excellent question. Um, this is something you need to talk to your users about. If you are working on an app that is privacy sensitive, then they need to opt into it. Uh, just like browsers ask you, can we send anonymous users, user usage statistics, for example. Um, it's also probably a good idea to not capture things like credit card numbers. Um, and so this is an example of, thing, of some of the customization you might have to do for your app. Um, but uh, for, a lot of, for a broad category of apps, this isn't a problem. For example, the app that I work on, there aren't really um, serious privacy concerns. Um, you're still going to want to tell your users. I, I wouldn't recommend doing something like this without letting your users know what they're getting into in terms of the information you're going to disclose. Yes? Uh, in the interest of like, front end performance, uh, is, is there a way to, like, if you have any plans to kind of narrow the scope of what Reanimator looks at and what it keeps track of? Uh, like, in, just in the interest of like, so, so the question is do I have any plans to limit the scope of what Reanimator looks at? I'm, I'm guessing you mean in terms of uh, events? Okay. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. So you you can kind of configure it. Um, uh, and you, you know, you, you can configure it on a per page basis if you want to. You'll need to restart the logs every time you load a new page, um, or implement something that allows you to like 
continual log. Um, and right now it only looks at some events. It doesn't look at all the events. And uh, there will be, uh, when, when it's ready for production, there'll be some way to specify, I want to, I want to listen to these events, but not to others. Um, you do need to listen to a lot, some events, even ones that you don't necessarily care about, because if you don't, then um, there's like hidden state. For example, if you don't, you're like, oh, I don't care about keypress. Well, you do, because keypress is what fills out forms. Um, looks like I'm out of time. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it.